We're talking baseball. We're just a campanella talking baseball. Well, as promised, Dirty Kurt's Dugout, first in-dugout guest, my friend, former Major League pitcher, big time, 21 years, David Boomer Wells, played for a number of teams just like I did, and they all loved him. This guy put up some serious numbers throughout the course of his career. Dave, welcome. Welcome to the show. I appreciate you coming. Thank you, Dirty Kurt. <laughs> Dirty Kurt's Dugout. <laughs> Dirty Kurt's Dugout. It. I love the name. 239 wins, mm. three All-Star games, yeah, two World Series championships. Hardware. Count. In a perfect game. Blind squirrel finds a nut. We're putting them all. <laughs> we're putting them all in the background. It's way, for a way second. back when. Please I got. I got to ask you something before I forget, and I'm forgetful. In high school, did you actually go around and get donations from <laughs> members of the Hell's Angels? I did. I did for your pitching ex- exploits in high school. You asked them each individually for. A certain amount of money for well, a strikeout. I had to earn it. I had to earn it. Yeah. Sure. So I did, like in Little League in high school, I would do 25 cents, a strikeout, a dollar a win, and $5 for a shutout. I was raking. I was the richest kid in Ocean Beach. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> because I had about 10 or 15 of those guys lined up. And so then they would all come to the games. And it was awesome. I had, I had my posse. And, and how do you line them up? Just... They all come over. The, to your house? Yeah, we lived in Ocean Beach. Every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there was a couple hundred motorcycles around the block, wrapped around the block, and they just came and hung out and socialized. It was great. It was, it was, it was a fun time back then in the, in the 60s, 70s. It was pretty awesome. It, when I'm driving down the freeway and one of those guys <laughs> pulls up next to me on a bike, I, I'm afraid. No, so no. They're... I, Teddy bears. Only because of the fact that all you do is see about it on television. Right. You hear all the negative and exactly. crazy stuff that they do, but you don't hear about the good things. It's like George Steinbrenner. You always heard about the bad things he did, not instead of the good things that he did. So, you know, it's kind of the same thing. But you know what? They just treat people the way they treat you, and you're not going to have a problem. George was good for the game. One of the, one of the teams that you played for, mm-hmm. the New York Yankees, as a matter of fact, Unbelievably, and, and this really is an unbelievable uh, statistic. Point Loma High School, you can see it right on his jacket, right on his hat, because he just came from a game. Uh, not only did David go there, but you also are coaching there at this time as we speak. Point Loma High School had a winter ball game uh, down in San Diego today before he graciously appeared on Dirty Kurt's dugout here uh, up in North <laughs> County, uh, San Diego. But you, David Cohn, and Don Larson. Correct. The only three Yankees ever to throw a perfect game. Right. And two of you went to the same high school. We did. Good trivia question. That's amazing. That is. That's, you know, the odds of that happening or they they did some statistic like about a couple weeks after I threw mine and it was some amazing number, like trillions and trillions of what it was that that could happen pretty good one and then coney threw his the, the next year right? the next year yeah and, and uh i think his was in july so larson's was in 56 56 october of 56 that, that great that prolific shot of yogi going out and yeah jumping up in his arms uh after the no hitter and yours was 98 98 may 17th so all of that time between yeah. those two, and then Coney, uh, David Cohn throws one the next year. Yeah. And you were still there. I was in Toronto. I got traded got for traded Clemens. Again. I got traded. So I was in Boston. And if I didn't have to pitch the next day, I'd have left that game and went to New York and hung out with Dave, like he did with me after our game. So you guys had after fun. After my game, yeah. Needless to say. Needless to say, it was pretty memorable you know on the field than even off the field it was just you know it, it's great because then you get new york city involved you know we go to a couple 
bars, people are there, they flock to you, you have media. It was, it was kind of interesting, but it was a lot of fun, and you celebrate. You celebrate good things like that, because they don't happen very often. Speaking of off the field, I, I think you and I could probably talk about off the field as good as any two guys <laughs> that ever played the game. <laughs> we covered it from 71 to 2000, what was your last year? 2007. 71 to 2007. Yeah. That's it's a, lot a lot of years. Of years. Yeah. But it's changed. And that ain't dog years. <laughs> and I know, unfortunately. <laughs> it's changed, though. Yeah. I mean, the game today has changed, but <laughs> what you're able to do and not do off the field yeah. has changed. It's called social media. Mm -hmm. And boy, is it stink. <laughs> it's bad. it's good if you're promoting something, but if you're not, it's and you just want to tend your own garden. There's always one of those little cameras following you, and you're under the microscope. If I was playing today, I'd just say spell my name right because I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do anyways. You know, so as long as just spell my name right, just spell my name right. But let's get <laughs> back to your your high school, Point Loma High School. We've already talked about it uh, at length in the show, and I want to talk about it some more. Um, what drew you to coach high school ball? I, I, I told myself when I'm done with my career, I'm never going back. I had no desire, whatever. I played 21 years um, and just wanted to enjoy my life. Um, trickled down to the field one day, watched the kids play, and one of the coaches is like, you should come out and work with us sometimes. I said, okay, no problem, work with the pitchers. Went down there and kind of took a liking to it. And that's kind of how it really started. And so I got involved. I was going to spring training with the Yankees um, and, and leaving for six weeks and then coming back and then taking over there. And that's kind of how I was doing it. And then they had another coach a couple years ago before I took over, and it was taking the program the other way. And I felt bad for the kids. So I just said, you know what, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take over the program. So I talked to the athletic director. They made it happen. And so I've been the head coach for my third or fourth year now. So that's kind of how I got involved with it. Just by accident, not really, you know, not really wanting to do it. Just, you know, kind of gradually got it. Because I was trying to get a job in the big leagues for seven, eight years. And I couldn't. I felt miserable. I call that knucklehead. That, that's, a, that's a whole other show right there. Oh, I know. I think. But that's kind of how it did. So I just said, you know what, I'm going to go into the high school. And I, and I started liking it. And so I've been there coaching for nine years now. But, you know, it's great. It's, it's fun. Because, you know, I learned from the best and not the best from managers. From Sparky Anderson, who was the best. Uh, Boach, learned from Boach. So you just kind of take a little piece from all the managers on the nine teams that I played for, three of them twice, so we had different managers. So that's kind of how it really evolved, and I just kind of take everything that I've learned and done in the game. And obviously, I'm not a hitting coach, but I know hitting because I've pitched against some of the best hitters. So I know what to throw. I, you know, you know, never let the, you know, the best guy on the team or the hottest guy on the team beat you. So you just try to tell your staff that and position certain guys the way they should be on the field. So that's as a head coach, that's what you do. But you got to know the whole game. And I've learned the whole game, you know, through 30 something years of baseball. If there's one or two things that you take from learning from the best. All right. What what was it? Patience. Patience was number 1 because I seen a lot of managers get hot and heavy and scream and yell like you have and in high school that's not the approach. Because if you start screaming and yelling, these kids get all nervous and, and they're scared. They go home, get on the boob <laughs> and get rejuvenated and come back because you, these kids are so sensitive. And these parents nowadays are, you know, they're telling their kids they're all stars. They're taking them all these travel ball teams or doing this and doing that. And they're telling how great they are until you get somebody who's been there, done that. I'll let you know how good Everybody you are. Everybody gets a trophy now. They do. And, that, and that's meet the parents or the Fockers, whatever. And what kind of prodigy is that, getting a 12th place ribbon or something like that? But, you know, to me, it's like you got to talk to them. you got to be real with them. you got to understand. you got to coach them up, but 
you got to teach them the game, and that takes patience. And that, to me, is really the thing. And then the rest of what I learned is what I did as a knucklehead growing up and in the big leagues, all the trouble that I got into, they just made me run. So when they, I don't yell, I just make them run. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Well, I've got a million more questions, but Sean from up in Orange County somewhere okay. is on the phone with us. Let's, uh, let's take this call from Sean. Sean, welcome to Dirty Kurtz Dugout. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've got a question for you. Um, I've got a son, a uh, really, really strong high school baseball player going into college. Trying to explain to him the um, ramifications of taking any kind of performance-enhancing drugs. And it's real tough to explain when he looks back at all these all-stars, you know, over the past uh, many, many years that seem to kind of just get away uh, with it when they use those type drugs. Um, what's your advice? How do you talk to a kid nowadays about well, that kind of stuff? Well, I, I, I played in the, in the steroid era, so um, to me, never doing them was something that, you know, and I'm pitching against these guys who did do them. So obviously it changes the game a little bit better, but then as, as a pitcher, you still got to pitch your game. So, you know, you make a mistake to most hitters, they're going to capitalize on it. But, you know, your mistakes were very minimal. So you had to be, you know, as a pitcher, you had to just challenge them. And my best thing is a pit, as a pitcher, learn how to pitch inside. So you take away them getting extended. Um, but to me, whoever's going to do the, uh, you know, do the, you know, who's ever dirty out there. I mean, that, that it's hard because these kids, they see that, oh, I want to be like that. So obviously their role models are there. You don't want that. You just stay clean as you can be. And, you know, and because I tell you what, at the end of the day, and you went out there and you did it and you did it right. I mean, you look at Derek Jeter, you look at Ken Griffey Jr., these guys who did it right, they didn't need them. And, and look where they're at now. They're a Hall of Famers. So, you know, you don't discourage. As a good, a good parent, you know, and, and I had two kids that played, and, and, and they just, you know, I tell them, just do it right. Don't worry about who's out there doing what. As long as you're doing it right, that's all that matters. Sean, thanks for the call. I appreciate it. You know, going back real quick to, uh, to what he said and what you were talking about, um, do you suspect that they're still using steroids now? They have to. I mean, some of the stuff that you see is, is beyond me. I mean, it went from big parks, you played in big parks, to now smaller parks. The mound was high. They lowered it because they wanted, they wanted more action in the game, more home runs. So, but Bob Gibson didn't care. Don Drysdale didn't care. They're going to put one in your earlobe anyways. But to me, it, it's, they keep changing the game, I think personally, for, for more of an offensive game because they just thought the game was boring. But, you know, when you see guys that go out there from all different eras, which I watched, you know, and you took part of it from earlier when I saw, you know, before I did. So to me, it's, it's a matter of, of knowing who can beat you when you're out there. When, for me on the mound, knowing who can beat you, try to minimize your mistakes. And you know what? Because you do not know in that lineup who is dirty. But then again, you know what? There might be a guy that looks like looks the part but isn't. And you could tell by, you know, the, now the way the ball is jumping. I mean, back when, when I first came up, I was throwing Don Manningly, Wade Boggs, up and away. That's how I used to pitch him. Fly balls to left field all day long. Now, now it's 25 runs. rows up. Mm -hmm. It's like, what the heck's going on in some of these big parks? So... To me, it's it's like I, I I still personally I still think they they're doing it. They're just they found a loophole to get around it for the testing. And the difference between then and now, mm -hmm. uh, to me, is pitching around guys in the lineup that you talk about that can hurt you. Right. I think there's more lineups nowadays where everybody can hurt you. That is. They're, they've gotten better, but then again, I mean, but you look at when you came when you came up, were you doing these extensive workouts, all these no. agilities and the strength training and all that kind of stuff? There was no strength tra training. Everything, I, everybody was against weights. I think the only guy back then was Brian Downing in the 70s, I, 80s. I, I think him. Brownie, he was a, you know, when I went and worked out with the Angels, he was just, he was yoked. He was a huge sucker, but he used to lift a lot of weights. 
you know, and then all of a sudden guys started wanting to get more power, so they went into the weights. If that didn't help, then they went to the they went to the dark side, and and that was the huge epidemic. And you know, at, at who knows what my numbers would have been? Who knows what David Cones or a bunch of these other guys' numbers would have been if that didn't occur? And who's never? What wins. about those numbers that they have? Would they be true? You look at Brady Anderson in '96. I was with the Orioles. He hit 50, 50, 51 home runs that year. And I'm prior to that, I don't even think he hit over 15. So it's like he's there. You go. What year was and that? And Rafael Palmero was on that team. In 96. So it's, who, who's to say? I mean, Palmero was dirty. He got caught. But, you know, Brady was in the gym. Brady was a gym rat. But who's to say that? Oh, did he ever follow up with any kind of home run total like that? No. Not even That's, close. It's strange, though. Yeah, it's, it's a one and done. It could be a fluke. I don't know. I mean, but Brady was one of those guys that was in the gym a couple times a day. But who's to say that he was doing other stuff? A lot of people so it's it's unless you test them you know and and the running and and here's the here's a crazy thing i got tested five times a year <laughs> i was fat <laughs> i never got tested once i got tested five <laughs> times a year because i used to pop off to that guy the commissioner so i think as a rebuttal on his part he just you don't just, even have a manfred ball you got a bud Selig ball that's fine well, not anymore. I scratched it <laughs> off. But to me, it's like, why are you wasting your time with me? I'm not throwing 98. Okay, I'm, I'm later in my career, I'm throwing in the 80s. And you got these other guys that are my age and older throwing in the high 90s. What part of that don't I understand? Tell your hitters to be aggressive. Tell your pitchers to pitch inside. Oh, Good I do. luck this year. Thank I know you, you do. <laughs> I know you learned that from Sparky. Well, you learned that from Boach. Oh, yeah, but the thing is, I don't have gray hair. He's only on the chin where I, where I can grow hair now. Hey, you don't have any hair. Well, if my knuckles, if they were gray, it'd be kind of cool. <laughs> Thanks again, Boom. You got it, buddy. I appreciate it. You know Come what? Again. My pleasure, because doing an interview with you, I've done few, but to get a guy who knows about the game, who understands the game, and can speak and let anybody understand the game, a four-year-old can understand what we're talking about. Those are the kind of interviews you want, and you're doing a great job at it. Those are the kids I like to really sit down and concentrate on what I'm saying, the four-year-olds. That's it. Yep. Whatever. Teach them a little ball. Hey, as long as they get it, then they could be stars <laughs> when, they're, when they're 20 That's in right. the big leagues. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, bud. I'm out. Goodbye. Life's a fastball.